Okay. All right, let's open with a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be back together as family, to visit with you and to spend time here this night. I pray that you would guide our conversation, that we would come closer to you and closer to the way that we are to fulfill your great commission on us. Help us, Lord, to love as we are loved and to share your gospel with the world around us. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would be with those among us who are sick, who are injured, those tonight that are facing surgeries tomorrow and in the coming days, those who have just had injuries of one sort or another in this last week and are recovering. Lord, I just pray that you would watch over and and keep us. We're, We're a congregation of needy bodies, and I pray that you would just touch body, mind, soul, spirit, emotion, that you would bring restoration and healing as you teach us and as you grow us. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, Bible books. Again, if you don't have them memorized yet, feel free to grab your Bible and flip it open the first couple of pages and use your cheat sheet. That's okay. That's how you learn. Starting with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. You guys are so good. I just love it. All right, so our question tonight only takes about two and a half seconds to answer. But I'm going to see how much time we can actually spend on it tonight. Uh, And I remind you that out on that table in the middle of the room is a yellow pad that is entitled Wednesday Night Questions. You write something down, I will do the research and answer your question. Uh, anything that you're dealing with, with the Bible, that you think God might have an answer to, some scripture that you're struggling with, whatever it may be, that's what we always use on these Wednesday nights. So this, this is, that's where I get these questions. And for those of you who have not yet heard, we are planning to do the Passover Seder meal again this year. We hadn't been able to do it the last couple of years for one reason or another, uh, but we're, we're excited to start it up this year again. So Friday of Easter weekend, which will be April 15th, uh, we'll be doing a, a Passover Seder as we've done in the past. This year, I'm going to tweak it up and change it. Uh, those of you who are from a, liter, uh, a more liturgical church background may know what a Tannenbrauch service is. And we're going to add a Tannenbrauch service to the end of the Passover. And if you're like, I have no idea what that is, hold on. It's going to be a wild ride. We'll have a lot of fun together as we celebrate Easter and prepare ourselves for Resurrection Sunday. Okay, and that's the other yellow pad that's out there. So don't write your question on the Seder meal, and don't sign up for the Seder meal on the questions, because then I'll just get all confused. The question for this evening, how and what is the best way to ask a new believer to join you at church? Like the questions that we've had recently, there are two or three different areas that I'd like to talk through as as we go through this this evening. Let me start with the idea of asking a new believer to join at church. A new believer indicates that they have faith. Where did they get that faith? 
Holy Spirit? Okay, that's kind of a trick question. But how do you get that faith? Well, somebody, how do they believe unless they hear? How do they hear unless they're sent? So how did this new believer become a new believer? We don't know. My point is this. The kingdom of God in America. I can't speak to the rest of the world. I haven't lived there. But the kingdom of God in America oftentimes pats itself on the back for getting new members when all they're really doing is sheep stealing from another fold. And what I'm saying is, is if they're already believers, they're probably already plugged into another church. Leave them alone. If they're being ministered to, I don't care what label's over the door, and I don't care who the pastor is. If they're getting fed, let them eat. Don't invite them to, it cracks me up. I got so many people say, hey, you know, I got this friend of mine who goes over to the Baptist church. I invited him to join here. Why? He's fine where he's at. Now, if you guys want to swap off every once in a while and go to each other's church just to see how they do things and to worship together, great. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all going to get to heaven together. But the fact of the matter is, we need to be careful that we don't go out there trying to find new folks for our church, which we'd love to have, when they're already plugged in somewhere else. You know, one of the lessons that Billy Graham learned was when he was first starting to do his crusades, he just showed up. And he would do an altar call, and he'd had 50 people come to the altar, and then he'd bail out of town, and you had a whole bunch of newly saved believers that weren't plugged into anything other than Billy Graham's crusade. And by the way, it just left town. So what is that guy that's going back to the factory Monday going to do next Sunday? Same thing he did the previous Sunday before he found Christ because he wasn't plugged in. And in that situation, Billy Graham and his crusade learned, and what they started to do was they would connect with all of the local churches when they were doing a crusade so that there were representatives there that when these new believers gave their hearts to God, there were people to plug them in so that when Billy Graham and his crusade left, there were still churches there that had a hold of the folks that had come forward and helped them to grow. So when you find a new believer that's not plugged in, Invite them to church, absolutely. But I just want to make that, that distinction that we've got to be very, very careful that we don't try to build our nest with somebody else's feathers. Okay? That let them grow where they're planted. So how then do I get someone to come to our church? Ask them. And I know that sounds so overwhelmingly simple, but it really is. The reality is when we are out in the society around us, there are a lot of people that are looking for somewhere to plug in. And we simply have to find what their need is and describe to them how we can scratch it. What their need is, it's Jesus Christ. You know, there is an old Sunday school joke, you know, that Jesus is the answer for everything. I always laugh at that. And you're thinking, why is that a joke? Well, because, you know, what do you put with coleslaw? Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer to every question. No, now you see where the joke comes from. The idea, though, is that when you narrow it down, every world problem, national, corporate, and individual, has a single root. It's called sin. And so if the person is lonely, or they're depressed, or they're sick, or they're hurt, or they're disillusioned, or they're disenfranchised, or they're marginalized, or they're whatever, what's the root of that problem? They're not plugged into Jesus. 
That's not to say that Christians don't get depressed, disillusioned, and disenfranchised. But I'm saying, why do those things happen? Because of the sin around us. So when we want to talk to people, we just want to talk to people. How can I get someone to be interested in my church? You won't. You don't. You can't. Get them interested in you. How do you make someone interested in you? You demonstrate interest in them. I spent many, many years as a military chaplain, and I had to sometimes walk into situations like I did before I deployed to Iraq where I was pulled out of the unit that I was serving and plugged into another unit, which means I had 530 new friends that I hadn't made yet. Does anybody remember me saying I'm an introvert? How in the world is this introvert supposed to figure out how to get to know 530 people? I don't do parties. I don't do get together. I don't know. I wouldn't know a party game to save my neck. I, I'm an introvert. It's just not what I do. How do I get to know 530 people? I walk up next to one of them and go, Hey, what's your job? Well, I do this. Huh. Well, that looks kind of fun. Tell me about it. Because every soldier on the planet assumes that the chaplain is clueless. So I would just play with that. The reality is, I'd been in a unit just like that and had done that exact job back when I was enlisted. But I didn't tell him I'd done that back when I was enlisted. I just ask him how he did his job. And I ask him about his family. And I ask him about what he did when he wasn't on drill with me. And I ask him, because here's a secret, if you haven't figured this out, people love to talk about themselves. And if you'll actually sit still and listen, they think you're awesome. That's all it takes to make somebody interested in who you are. Demonstrate an interest in who you are. They are. Because as they share where they're at and what they're doing, we're human beings. We can't go four sentences without complaining about something. And the moment I get somebody talking about who they are, they're going to start complaining about their family. Or talking about where they work, and they're going to tell me about what they think. Or they're going to start talking to me about their politics. Or they're going to start talking to... You get somebody talking, and pretty soon they're going to hand you something that goes, here's where I'm hurting. Here's my opportunity. What are you doing to salve that wound? What are you doing to, to ease that pain? What are you doing to make that not hurt so bad? How's that working out for you? Because I know of a solution that will work better. It's Jesus Christ. And it's really that easy. You see, part of the problem is in the last 50 years of the church, again, it may have been going on longer. You guys would know that more than I would. I've only been around for 51 years, so I'm still making this up. But in the 50 years that I've been a part of the church, we have been gung-ho about programs. How many of you guys have been to a seminar at a church where you were taught how to use the Roman road? Really? Really? Only like two people are, are nodding their heads at this point. I have the Roman road written in my margins of my Bible. I got the first one, and I was taught a really cool trick. You write the first passage on the inside of your Bible, and when you flip to that one, how do you want the person to interact with the Bible? Do you want to read it to them? No, you want them to read it for themselves. So right, right in the margin at the top of the page, upside down, the next verse because that way while they're reading the verse you know where you're going to the next one and you can flip it and then they can read that one and you got the next verse right and right there at the top of the bible upside down where when you've got the bible facing them you can read it just fine 
you know what? The Roman road works. It's a great t it's a great tool. If the person you're talking to cares about the Bible. But what do you do when somebody says that Bible isn't what it proclaims to be? Then how do I witness to somebody who discounts the Bible? <gasps> Terror. Panic. What do I say? Let me give you a little church history. When the Gospels were written, Jesus had been dead for almost 25 years. By the time you get those books out to the churches where people could start to memorize it, it's 20, 25 years after. That's why most of these epistles were written, these letters that, that, that Paul and Peter and the rest, because these folks were starting churches and they didn't have any guidelines. And they were like, what in the world do we do? And what do we tell people? And how do we witness to people? And how do we get new believers to join us at church? They were asking the exact same questions we're asking now. And so they started writing these letters to this church. Well, here's how you do this, and here's how you do that, and here's how you do this other thing. So how do you think the church grew? Because Acts tells us that the church grew hundreds and thousands of people a day. By the time you're three years in, all of Asia Minor had heard the gospel. They didn't use the Roman road. It hadn't been written yet. How in the world did they witness to these people when they didn't have a Bible to quote? Well, they had the Old Testament, but not the New. They told them about what Jesus did in their lives. How many of you know Jesus Christ? How many of you, that knowledge of Jesus Christ profoundly changed your life? If you don't raise your hand on that question, I question the first answer. Because if you know Jesus, He messed with you. Okay? So if you know where you were and you know where you are, do you think you've got a Jesus story to tell somebody? Oh, but, but I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I don't have this great big story. <laughs> so what? You don't have my story. I don't have your story. God gave you a unique story, just like He gave every one of the guys and gals that wrote these stories. I mean, our women's Bible study right now is studying Esther. What is the book of Esther? One chick's story. Just like Ruth, it's one chick's story. Does Ruth and Esther have the same story? Not even a little bit. And God made it so that people would be led to Him through Esther's story that may not get reached through Ruth's story. He gives us different stories so that we can tell that story. You see, I don't have to use the Bible to tell you about the God that the Bible is all about because that God has been doing some incredible things in this guy. And I got a whole bunch of people in my church that know the same God. And every one of them has a different story. Boy, you know what? We could get about, oh, I don't know, we got now 70 or so on a Sunday morning. I bet if we wrote everybody's stories down, we'd come up with 66 books. Hello? We make this harder than we need to, friends. It's not about memorizing enough Scripture that I'll know what to say. There's an old cliche, maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't, but I love it. God doesn't care about your ability. 
He cares about your availability. You don't need to know. You just need to show up. The Bible, you know, if we look at Second Tim or yeah, First Timothy sixteen three sixteen says, you know, the Bible is given for all of these things to make the worker effective in what he's doing. Well, that's why we read it to make us effective in what we're doing. But how do I get effective in what I'm doing? You go out and do it. Let me see if I can make that make sense. Has anybody in this room sat down at a baby grand and played one of Beethoven's sonatas without looking at the music or ever practicing? Why do you think it's any different to tell people about God? No, you're not going to do it right the first time. But that's how you learn. And the second time, you get a little better. And the third time, you get a little better. And the fourth time, you get a little better. And the fifth time, you get a, And the 500th and the 6,000th. Every time, you just approach another human being and you start talking. And some of them you're going to connect with. And some of them you won't. That's what Jesus was teaching in the parable about the ground. You remember the four grounds? The rocks, the prepared, the not... The birds came and took. This one grew up and then died. There's this neat little parable Jesus teaches. Well, all the farmer did was throw the seed. I don't have to prepare the ground. That's the Holy Spirit's job. I don't have to get that person ready to receive Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's job. My job is to step out into that field and start throwing seed. A lot of us are nervous because we don't know how to turn the corner into talking about Jesus. I mean, here we are talking about the hogs. Here we are talking about the weather. Here we are talking about politics. Here we are talking about anything else, and suddenly we got to bring Jesus into the room. How do you do that? Well, it's really simple. Don't ever ask him to leave the room. Because if I am in touch with Christ, and I have been transformed by Christ, then Christ ought to drip out of just about everything I do. There's a Christianese, there is a language that we use as Christians that the world can spot because they don't talk like that. They go to parties, not fellowship. Yeah, we, we use words differently. You tell somebody out on the street that you just want to love on them in Jesus' name and they're going to be like, ooh, back off, friend. Because they have no idea what that means and they're not sure it's a good thing. But what I think about a sports team is going to be influenced by my God. What I think about the weather is going to be influenced by my God. What I think about politics is going to be influenced by my God. What I think about any topic is going to be influenced by my God. And so if I'm talking to you about any of those subjects, I'm just automatically going to start talking about God. Can you believe those knuckleheads up in Washington? Yeah, that's the benefit of living in a fallen world. What? Well, they're all creeps. Yeah, we elected them. Lack of wisdom, my people perish. God's just there. He's just a part of it. So part of this thing is getting out of the mindset of Talking about Jesus is different than talking about every other subject. No, it's not. Just talk. There are some great questions we can ask. Things like, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. I don't have one. Okay, cool. Now I know where we stand. 
there are some questions we shouldn't ask. Are you saved? Saved from what? Are you a believer? Yes, I believe I'll have another drink. Okay, that's what happens when we start trying to spring Christianese on people. They have no idea what that word means. That's a church word. Don't, don't use a church word. Just talk. I think the greatest part of the Great Commission as we look at Matthew 28 is this idea that it's not go ye into all the world. And I've talked to you guys about this before. A better understanding of that is as you are going through the world. Philippians says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it as unto the Lord. If we're going to be Christ's ambassadors, stop and think about that for a second, friends. Have you ever known of an ambassador to a foreign country to be in that country at any time, day or night, and not be the ambassador? I mean, even when he's got his bike shorts on and he's out there pedaling somewhere, he's still the ambassador. Even when he's dipping down at the beach, he's still the ambassador. When he's dust up in the tuxedo at the state dinner at the palace, he's still the ambassador. No matter what he's doing, when he's checking his mail, when he's washing his dog, when he's pumping gas into the car, he's still the ambassador. 24-7, 365, he represents that country to that other country. You guys are citizens of the kingdom of God. And you are Christ's ambassador. And you live in a very sin-sick, fallen world. And whether you're wearing your bike shorts, pedaling somewhere, dipping at the beach, kicking it at the house, washing the dog, pumping gas in the car, you're an ambassador. I haven't been formally trained as an ambassador. Yeah, you have. You've been saved and blood-bought and washed clean. That's all all the training you need. That's it. You see, we make this harder than it needs to be. How do I talk to people about Jesus? I don't know. How do you talk? If you can figure out how do the tongue and teeth thing work and speak words, you can talk about Jesus. The reality is inside of us, we are nervous. We want to be popular. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to screw it up. We think we can... Met Stop and realize that if you're afraid, and I know every one of us are, I'm not throwing any rocks. If you're afraid to talk to somebody about Jesus, why are you more afraid to talk about Jesus than you are afraid of Jesus? Well, we shouldn't be afraid of him. He's God. And if that doesn't terrify you, you, you don't understand God. Now, yeah, he's loving. Yes, he's compassionate. Yes, he is merciful. Yes, he has forgiven us. Yes, he has washed us clean. Yes, he has gone all of this way for us. But at the end of the day, he is not my drinking buddy. He is my God. He can speak and worlds come into existence. He holds his tongue and worlds cease. He is almighty, all-powerful, awesome, and incredible. And with that said, if God's for me, who can be against me? So what do I have to be afraid of? I'll be unpopular. Okay, yeah, and someday I'm going to be dead. How many of you were popular when you were born? I wasn't either. How many of you have ever been popular with your spouse? Don't answer that one. <laughs> How many of you are, you know, popular with your hairstylist? Of course you are. You bring money. You see, we're all hung up about popularity. We want to fit in. We don't want to be weird. Why not? 
Has being weird ever hurt somebody? Yeah. If the person you're being weird around is biased and they hate people that are weird. There's been some points in history where we've killed one and over such things. But if I'm dead, I'm not worried about it. It's like, okay, that's twice now. You've talked about the dead thing. Do you realize how discomforting that is? No, it's a one-way ticket home to paradise. Because I know who my God is. And now most people aren't going to kill you for offering your faith. They might persecute you. They might call you a bad name. Okay, has anybody else ever been to junior high? I've been called bad names before and, yep, still got a pulse. Still here. You see, talking to people about God, bringing people into the church, bringing people into the kingdom of God is just about being people. You got your Bible. Oh, I messed up and lost the passage I had. That's what I get for using my Bible as an illustration. Oh, uh, see if I can find it real quick. God, you are so good. I just flipped right back to it. Colossians chapter 4. How do we minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world around us in one easy lesson? Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2 and going through verse 6. That's right. Paul narrows it down for us in four and a half verses. Look at it with me. Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Let's stop there. How many of you pray? How many of you pray consistently? How many of you pray realistically? What do you mean by that? Don't kid yourself thinking that God doesn't already know you think He's screwing it up. I mean, how many of you have ever told God how to heal one of your neighbors? Like, He doesn't know what He's doing? Like, He doesn't already have a plan? Like, He was waiting for you to pray before He could do something? Oh, I'm so glad you prayed for Tom. I've been wanting to heal him for three days. So how should we pray? Hi, God. Me again. Screwed up like normal. Let's start with, you're awesome and I'm not. You're God and I'm not. And I need your forgiveness for every single moment I have forgotten that since the last time we talked. I got a whole bunch of broke friends and we need you. I don't even know how to pray to say, I need you to heal them this way, or I need you to heal them that way, or I need you to do this, or I need you to... I don't know what your plan is, and I don't know what your will is in their life. I just need you to be God. And I need to praise you when you are. Which means I need to be praising you all the time. See, we make prayer formal. Oh, Godeth, if thouest wilt... Oh, stop it. I showed you an informal prayer, but I want you to recognize it was not a disrespectful prayer. Hey, God, what's up, man? Yeah, mm -mm. Not my drinking buddy. Father. Hey, Dad. I recognize who I am speaking to. And speak to Him. I don't have to hide behind religious piety because I'm His kid. I can crawl up in His lap, throw my arms around His neck, and tell Him how much I love Him. 
And I can rest assured that he already knows I'm going to ask for the keys to the car. Then I already know he's going to say no. And we're going to have a good conversation. We've got to stop pretending that we're God. You see, to be devoted to prayer, the single best example I can think of is a 16-year-old boy getting his first love letter. He'll carry that thing in his pocket. About the only place it won't go is the shower. And every chance he gets, he's opening it back up again. And he's rereading it. And he's rereading it. And he folds it back up and he puts it away and then he opens it up and he's rereading it. Why? Because he's absolutely in love with this girl. He doesn't have a clue yet in the world what love is. But he's absolutely in love with this girl. And he can't wait to talk to her. And he'll talk to her about absolutely nothing. How many of you guys remember talking to a significant other about absolutely nothing for hours on end? By the way, if you wonder what's gone stale in your relationship that you're in now, when's the last time you spent a couple of hours talking about absolutely nothing now we're always worried about the kid the grandkid the car the electric bill medicaid which doctor appointment we've got to go to when's the last time you just stopped and talked about who was your favorite band what's your favorite color let's go miniature golf and pick up a pizza you understand what i'm saying about relationship here and you recognize that you're not in a religion with Jesus Christ, you're in a relationship with Him. To devote yourself to prayer is to be absolutely cannot wait to talk to Jesus again. Matter of fact, I'm not going to wait, I'm just going to keep talking while we're talking. While I'm standing there trying to talk to somebody that I'm trying to witness to or trying to get them to come to my church, I'm praying in the back of my mind because God reads my mind. And I may not be saying the words out loud, but God and I are already talking because I'm talking to you and I don't know what I'm saying. I'm trying to lead you to Christ and I don't know how to do that. I need some help. I'm having that conversation while I'm having this conversation. It's what Isaiah was talking about when he talked about praying consistently. Pray constantly. You're just never off each other's hip. You don't have to go anywhere to get God's attention. You don't have to do anything to get God's attention. All you've got to do is speak, and God's already paying attention. So talk to Him. Be devoted to prayer. And part of prayer is also um, learning how to shut up and listen, and then doing what He said. Devote yourselves to prayer. Get into having constant communication with God. That's where it starts, friends. Because God can't direct you to the person He wants you to talk to if you're not talking to Him so He can tell you where to go. He can't put the words into your mouth for you to speak to that person that He's put you in contact with because you haven't been listening to Him to know what to say. You see, if I'm devoted to Christ, if I'm devoted to prayer, I'm talking to Him all the time and He's going to go, hey, that guy right there, go pray with him seriously, I don't even know this guy, and he's got ankle biters. Ugh. I mean, it's already hard enough to pray with somebody in a store that I don't know. It's even harder when they got kids running around, because what happens when we start praying? They start peeling wallpaper. God's like, dude, go talk to that person. Have you ever had God tell you to go talk to somebody? You ever have God tell you to stop driving and go back and get that hitchhiker that looks scary? Because he will. What in the world am I going to do when I get... Uh, doesn't matter. So I'm going to need some help here. Be devoted to prayer because it's in that prayer that God can speak and you can hear. It's in that life. Be devoted to prayer. He continues, being watchful. <laughs> yeah, things are going to pop up, and if you're not looking, you'll miss it. So be talking to God, but be watching for opportunities. Because they're there. That dude is sitting over there by, on that bus stop all by himself. By the way, 
great way to witness to folks, except they, they think you're weird. Of course, I've been accused of that anyway. You know, stop at a bus stop and ask a guy if he wants a ride. I mean, he's obviously already going somewhere. Dude, I'll save you 27 cents. Where are you going? Seriously, I'll give you a ride. You're a stalker. Okay. I'm offering you the ride. You can get in, you can not get in. If he gets in, where are you headed? Tell me about your work. What's going on? I may only have 45 seconds with this guy as we drive across town because I drive that crazy. But when we get there, I've made a connection with a human being and I've treated him with love and respect and courtesy and he's going to have a brighter day because we were together. There was a time where there was an airstrike and my family was in an area and we were bored pretty much. And so we got on the little tram that goes around DFW and it was Christmas time and we started singing Christmas carols. You know, there's an airstrike. People can't get where they need to go. They are hacked off. They are miserable. They get into this tram to go from one place to another, and they're like, oh, great. We've got that group. And while we were just singing Christmas carols and having fun, we would break off one by one and just go over and go, hey, how's your day going? What's going on? Where are you trying to get to? Man, it's, it's tough, isn't it? Not being able to get places. And there was not a single person that got off of that tram the way they got on it. And we didn't browbeat anybody with the Word of God, and we didn't try to shove the Gospel down anybody's throat. We just loved on people and ministered, and we trusted the Holy Spirit to do whatever He needed to in that person's life as they left that tram. Be watchful. There's situations all around you. So devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. I am so glad God gives me the opportunity to be His ambassador. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. See, part of the problem with witnessing is we're like, I'm not sure I can do that. Instead of going, cool, God, thanks for letting me try. Thankful. I know what God's done for me. I want to thank Him. How can I thank you, Daddy? Tell somebody else. Okay. Check this out. If Mo or I looked over at Aries and said, hey, I want you to go tell that person about Jesus. He'd be like, okay. No fear. Said, yeah, but he's a kid. Said, yeah, and Jesus said, have faith like a child. The difference between him and you is you're overthinking it. Go talk to him about Jesus. And be thankful. He continues, verse 3, and pray for us too. Ooh, see, there's more prayer going on here. That God may open the door for our message. Oh, that's right back to that watchfulness. I'm watching, but I don't see any open doors. God, show me the open doors. Pray for me that God may open doors for the message, comma, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Give me the opportunity. God, give me an opportunity. Put me in, coach. See, far too often we're, I don't want to do that. Instead of saying, hey, what am I going to lose? He continues, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. <laughs> <laughs> that's Paul wonder apostle to the Gentiles writer of how many books in this and he's going hey pray for me that I get this right I mean that's literally what he just said pray for me that I may proclaim it clearly as I should I'm not sure how to say this to this guy or how to say it to that guy. I'm in a new situation here. I, I don't have a patter. I don't have this thing. Pray for me that I might speak clearly as I should. Well, if I can pray for him that way, I can pray for me that way. That's part of it. You want to be that ambassador? You want to be that witness? Pray that I might proclaim it clearly, as I should. I will tell you that that verse I have done so many times. Like, 
between me and Paul. <laughs> I see him on the street. He's like, okay, God, I'm going to need some words here. Hey, bud, how's it going? Waiting for the bus? Yeah, me too. Where are you headed? Wait, you didn't start talking Jesus. No, if you walk up to somebody and you start with Jesus, conversation's done. Because almost everybody has been beat up by somebody who believes something that starts with it. I get one more person tells me what they think about the mask mandate. I don't care what your opinion is. Why are you even talking to me? Whether I agree with you or not, shut up. Care about me. Then I'll care about what you think. So you've got to be human to people. And you've got to start that clearly because you're going to get that opportunity because God's set this situation up and you're not on your own. He finishes in verse 5 or continues in verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. <laughs> be smart about how you do this. <laughs> Nobody wants to be bashed upside the head with a 90-pound Schofield reference Bible. Don't start the conversation. Be wise with outsiders. Are you saved? Saved from what? Dude, seriously, I'm waiting on a bus. Go away. Instead... So where are you headed? That way. Yeah, work or home. I ah, headed back to the house. Long day? Eh, not too bad. We're just talking. Well, what happens if I'm talking and we get to that point and, and there's no time for us to talk about Jesus? There will be tomorrow. Dude's catching a bus. He probably catches it regularly. And what if I don't get to Jesus? You know what? We're going to get there in just a second because it's the next verse. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's right there, guys. Conversation's full of grace. Grace is how God saves the world. Have your conversation full of how God saves the world. Seasoned with salt. <laughs> That's the part we're uncomfortable with. Salt burns. We, we, we might use the word truth to, to, to replace salt in that. You're going to speak some truth into somebody else's life and they may be receptive and they not, may not be receptive. I mean, I know when I've got an open wound that salt would help heal it, but that doesn't mean I want you rubbing it in there because it still hurts. Seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. You see, that's why God reminds us that we're supposed to speak the truth in love because we want to speak the truth in salt lick. I mean, we want to give the whole thing to you. <clears throat> Seasoned with salt. There was something that was made. Oh, it was, it was last weekend for, for the party. Yeah, we made some bakala. Not baklava, that's a Greek dessert. Bakala is salted cod. And you have to rinse it for like three days to get it down to palatable. And it didn't arrive in time for the party we were throwing. So we rush dipped it. Dipped it, rinsed it, dipped it, rinsed it, dipped it, rinsed it. And instead of taking 72 hours, we took 24. You couldn't hardly eat that stuff. It was so salty. 
We got around it, but then we blew up like seed ticks for the next three days, retaining water. <laughs> 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 that was not seasoned with salt. That was overwhelmed with salt. It doesn't say overwhelm. It says be wise and speak gracefully, seasoned with truth. Don't go banging people over the head with truth. You don't like it. You'll meet me in the foyer going, man, stepped on my toes this morning. Well, if you don't like it, when Jesus is already at work and the Holy Spirit already lives in you, and you're already more accustomed to the truth than the person out in the world, if you don't like being dumped on with truth, what makes you think some heathen out there that doesn't know Jesus from anybody needs you coming into their life telling them all the places they're messed up? I had a great, 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 great chaplain pastor train me. He says, you know, when I go down to the motor pool, I never tell, and he says, I never talk about sin. I was like, wait a minute. You're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you not talk about sin? He says, they already know their sin. They need to know about hope. Remember that we were said that we're supposed to be ready to give an answer we have for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Not to give an answer for all the ways I think you're screwing up life. I don't need to tell you your sin. You already know. The Holy Spirit's already working on you. I have to give you the hope that there's a way out of that. That there is a Savior. That there is salvation. That there is a future for you. And that's the truth. That is the truth. The good news. That's the salt. If I'm bringing grace and the truth of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that is the single best thing that everybody on the planet is looking for, whether they know it or not. How do I know how to answer people? How do I know how to talk to people? I don't. But this verse, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know. Oh, well, let's flip it back over on its head then. If, how do I know how to answer everyone? Let my conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Oh, well, there's the answer. So let's look at what Paul is telling us here through this verses out of Colossians 4. Devote yourself to prayer, watch for opportunities, and be thankful for what He's done for you. Because when you're talking to Jesus all the time and you're watching for opportunities to, to do the Great Commission thing around you and you're thankful for everything that God has done for you and you're praying that God will open doors for the message so that you can proclaim what God has given you the opportunity to proclaim and you're praying that you might actually proclaim it clearly as you should and then you're exercising wisdom in the way you come at somebody... And then when we do get the chance to talk, we're just people. We're not carrying picket signs. We're not judging anybody. We're just being people. How broken are you on the inside? In that silent quiet place at 2 o'clock in the morning when the Holy Spirit wakes you up and you've got no facade and you've got no clothes and you're tired and you just want things to go away and you look inside of you, how broken are you? You can sit here and play the church face with me. But you know You're just as broken as that person that you're trying to minister to. That's a great place to start. Because the only difference between Christians and non-Christians is we have a hope. And we've found the forgiveness 
that is waiting for them. You're not coming as some sort of superior to hand them a delicacy. You're just another pig at the trough hoping to show them where the potatoes are. And when we understand that, then it's not... It is nothing more than being in a tribe of starving people and finding a loaf of bread. Just take the bread back to the group. That's all we got to do. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this night. I thank You for this teaching and I pray, Lord, that something will stick. Lord, we are a fearful people and we fear the wrong things. We give way too much importance to being liked on Facebook popular with our herd, politically correct. We're scared. And you know it. Lord, fill us with your Spirit in boldness and in wisdom. Remind us, Lord God, that You're not asking us to save the world. You're asking us to be a witness to what we've seen You do in our lives. You've asked us to learn Your Scriptures so that we would be encouraged, not that we could quote it at somebody on the street. Lord, we hide Your Word in our hearts that we might not sin against You. We hide Your Word in our hearts to make us effective at what we're going to do. But You've told us if we'll show up and open our mouths, You would put the words in our throat. That when we stood before anyone to give an answer, You would speak through us. Remind us, Lord, that You just need us to be available. We don't have to witness to every single person coming down the street that You will show us when to stop, where to stop. Because there's folks out there that are ready to hear, and there are folks out there that aren't, and You know who they are, and we don't. And if we'd listen, You'd show us the right ones. Remind us of the man laying at the pool of Siloam. Hundred people around that pool waiting to get healed. Jesus walks by, 99 of them, and walks up to one dude. Do you want to be healed? Take up your mat and go home. Turns around and walks away. Why? Because those other 99 weren't ready. He had the wisdom and the discernment to speak, see the one, speak to the one, and bring the one into the kingdom. Lord, You've promised that You'll show us. Lord, temper our fear with Your grace. Give us a profound vision of hell so that we might be more concerned that that person not show up there, then we show up unpopular. Guide our thoughts. Guide our words. That we might be in conversation with You, watching for opportunities, thankful, graceful, seasoned with salt, yielded to You. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.